Grenada was the target. The aim was to overthrow the revolution led by the New Jewel Movement and to return the ousted tyrant Eric Gehry to power. Mercenary leader Michael Perdue of Houston, Texas, began plotting his counter-revolution as soon as he read published accounts of the revolution in the spring of 1979. First, he sought out Gary, met him in San Diego, and put forward this proposition. For a price, Perdue would overturn Maurice Bishop's government and reinstate Gary as prime minister. Gary agreed and told Perdue to proceed. Purdue then contacted his old friend in New Orleans, David Duke, one-time Nazi and former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, now leader of the National Association for the Advancement of White People. Duke helped by putting Purdue in touch with several of his contacts, beginning a tangled web of international fascist intrigue and high finance. One of Duke's referrals was to German-born German born Wolfgang W. Droge, D-R-O-E-G-E, -E, an organizer for the KKK in Canada whose father had been a personal friend of notorious Nazi war criminal Julius Stryker, last name S-T-R-E-I-C-H-E-R. -E -E Another was Don Andrews, A-N-D-R-E-W-S, former head of the Western Guard, Canada's neo-Nazi party. A third was J.W. Kirkpatrick, a prominent, a prominent attorney in Memphis, Tennessee, whose ties to Duke and the Klan had never been publicly revealed. Keep in mind Kirkpatrick here, because we're going to talk about him again later in the broadcast. Each of these men eagerly joined the burgeoning conspiracy against the young revolution in tiny Grenada. Droge became second in command of the invasion force. Andrews recommended using the island of Dominica as a base for the attack on Grenada, and on the recommendation of his friend Arnie Poli, P-O-L-I, P -O -L -I, invested in a Dominican coffee firm to furnish cover for intelligence gathering trips and supply shipments. Kirkpatrick and an unidentified associate contributed $10,000 to help finance the plot. Purdue later said he got another $45,000 from James White, a business associate. In Toronto, they worked out a plan for the attack. It called for Gary to accompany the landing party from Dominica and lead as Grenadian supporters. But Gary refused. He was unwilling to land until a mercenary force had captured police headquarters in the army barracks. The argument that ensued between Purdue and Gary ended their partnership, and Purdue began to consider other possibilities. Well, specifically, Purdue uh, redirected this uh, incipient Klan and Nazi coup against the island of Dominica. Initially, as we just saw, to the island of Dominica was to have been used as an operational base for the planned attack upon Grenada. Now, one of the details here that Lawrence points out, which uh, is significant for our purposes here, is the fact that Michael Perdue represented this coup attempt. He represented the incipient coup against Dominica as basically as a U.S. government operation. This is how he represented it to the Klansmen and Nazis he recruited for his group. And obviously, all official uh, statements concerning this venture were that uh, Purdue's statements about U.S. government support were puffery. However, as we're going to see, there are indications that indeed the government may have had unspecified connections with this particular coup attempt, or at least with this particular group, if not for this particular attempt. At any rate, if Michael Purdue's claims that uh, the United States government was behind this Klan and Nazi coup, Ken Lawrence writes as follows. All the recruits were gathered under false pretenses. Purdue told them he was a Vietnam veteran with combat mercenary experience in both Nicaragua and Uruguay. He claimed he had backing from the CIA and the State Department, and that former Texas Governor John Connolly and U.S. Representative Ronald Paul of Houston knew what he was doing and approved of it. He told them he would be fighting communism in Dominica. Still another indication, a very hard indication, of the involvement of U.S. government forces uh, in this particular Klan and Nazi coup attempt concerns the fact that all the Klansmen and Nazis gathered at and were recruited from a mercenary training school which is run by the Ku Klux Klan. It, um, and I guess actually this is not formally a Ku Klux Klan mercenary training school. The Klan itself does have a number of uh, sort of so-called Klan and Special Forces training school, Klan Special Forces training schools, but uh, this particular group of Klansmen and Nazis were assembling at uh, the mercenary training school of a fellow by the name of Frank 
Camper, last name C-A-M-P-E-R. As it turned out, Frank Camper works for the FBI. He's an FBI informer. And uh, in addition, it's worth noting that uh, Camper's entire mercenary school was once busted near a nuclear power plant where they were conducting some sort of unspecified operation. At any rate, keep in mind the fact that uh, Frank Camper is a government agent because it was at his camp that the basic recruiting was done for this particular uh, attempted coup against Dominica, again, done by Klansmen and Nazis. Of Frank Camper's work for the U.S. government, Lawrence writes as follows. Uh, this little subsection of the article is entitled, Camper's Training School and the FBI. The article begins with a short subsection here, begins with a... a a uh, photocopy of an ad that appeared in Soldier of Fortune. The ad reads as follows. Mercenary School, seven-day survival course, seven-day combat course. Professional cadre, affordable training in demolitions, weapons, unarmed combat. Details and applications, one dollar. Send it to P.O. Box 309, Dolomite, Alabama, 35061. And then Lawrence writes as follows. In our first installment, we showed that this advertisement from the March 1981 Soldier of Fortune recruited potential mercenaries for Franklin Joseph Camper's training school. Camper was aware of the Dominica plot, but declined to participate. In July, Camper's training school received considerable play in the press. Feature stories with photographs in the Washington Star, the Christian Science Monitor, the Huntsville Times, and hundreds of other papers via Associated Press. Nearly all of the free advertising for mercenary training in the U.S. was promoting Frank Camper, it seemed. But two weeks after the publicity blitz began, the Birmingham News and the Tampa Tribune learned that Camper was an FBI informer when the Dade County prosecutor listed him as a key witness against his erstwhile partner, Robert Lisenby, on explosives and weapon charges in Miami. Lisenby is L-I-S-E-N-B-Y. Camper's cover had been so effective that Lisenby's father wrote to Soldier of Fortune following his son's arrest to solicit information. Why would anyone with Mr. Camper be arrested? He seems like a very fine young man, and according to my son, Robert is one of his best friends. Yet right now, it seems like both face very stiff prison terms due to some informer. If anyone can shed any light on the matter, please write us. The same issue also ran a letter ridiculing Camper for the training exercise near a Florida nuclear power plant that got his entire school, unquote, arrested for trespassing. Camper wasn't happy that he'd been exposed. The reason I worked with the government is to help counter terrorism, and I can't do that if my identity is known. He also feared that the unwanted publicity would hurt his mercenary school. The Bureau has done me a great deal of harm, unquote. Once the truth was out, Camper admitted that his work for the FBI began years ago when he posed as a disgruntled Vietnam vet, unquote, in order to spy on the Alabama Black Liberation Front and the Communist Party. ABLF activists contacted by CAIB had no recollection at all of Camper, but Jim Baines, B-A-I-N-S, now secretary of the Birmingham Peace Council, remembered him well. I don't think he ever successfully infiltrated anything. As far as I know, everybody assumed he was a cop. He was such a classic. I vividly recall the first time he showed up, in his fatigues, at an anti-draft meeting at Birmingham Southern College in 1969 or 70. He advocated bombs, blowing up draft boards, and things like that. Everyone thought either he was absolutely crazy, or more likely a provocateur sent to destroy the anti-war movement, unquote. For a brief period, Camper's ads disappeared from Soldier of Fortune, but apparently most of his potential recruits missed the stories about his FBI connection. He now advertises his Merck school as, quote, best in the USA, unquote. The April 1982 issue of Gung Ho, another mercenary magazine in which Camper advertises, contains a long article about his training school complete with color photos. It not only makes no mention of Camper's career as an informer, but actually implies the opposite, mentioning his two arrests in Florida and his connection with the Dominica coup plot. I knew he had been in, quote, I knew he had been in and out of controversy and jail through confrontations with the law, especially with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, unquote, wrote the author. So it would seem that Camper has successfully restored his cover, placing him in an enviable position for a government agent. Many of the most serious potential mercenaries will be attracted to him. Those the government may find useful can be recruited for the usual dirty work, 
while those who support causes not approved by the U.S. can be found out and stopped. Well, as mentioned, uh, once the falling out between Purdue and Eric Gary occurred, the target of this intended Klan and Nazi coup was switched from Grenada to the base island of Dominica. Initially, or we'll call it Dominica, a small island in the Caribbean was to be, well, really was to serve the incipient coup group as a base of operations and as a supply base. Now, one of the interesting things concerning the, the abortive coup against Dominica, the, the plotters were arrested and never got uh, to even put their plan into effect. They were arrested on their way to the boat that they were going to take to Dominica in order to overthrow the government there of uh, Prime Minister Eugenia Charles. Now, one of the inter interesting things concerning the uh, aftermath, I guess you could call it, of the attempted Klan or Nazi coup was that uh, Prime Minister Charles used the attempted coup as an excuse to crack down on the left in Dominica. Now, this is an interesting thing because, of course, this coup was a, an attempt by ultra-rightists, and yet, nonetheless, the uh, Prime Minister of Dominica, who, as we're going to see in just a minute, is quite close to the United States and the Reagan administration, she used this as an excuse to crack down the, on the left. <clears throat> Ken Lawrence describes this as follows. Although the plotting has been the work of discredited former officials partly backed by outside fascists, Prime Minister Eugenia Charles has used these episodes as a pretext for a crackdown on leftists and a general escalation of political repression. The Dominica Liberation Movement says, quote, a reign of police terror, unquote, has descended upon the island since the original state of emergency was declared, including the brutal killing of a youth, John Rose Lindsay, in police detention, and the routine use of torture during interrogation. Eleven other police killings have also been protested by the DLM. Newspapers from Cuba and Grenada have been banned by the government. DLM General Secretary Bill Riviere, R-I-V-I-E-R-E, -E, protested a police rampage last June. Quote, Young men and some women were punched in the head and jaw, kicked in the groin, slapped in the, in the face. A few were gun-butted in the head and others in the face and stomach. And some were kicked in the face and head as they fell to the ground. These blows were accompanied by insults of the worst kind. One victim lost a number of teeth and another's head and face were severely battered. Yet in the end, not a single one of them has been charged. Still uh, more interesting is the fact that not only did this attempted right-wing coup serve Prime Minister Charles of Dominica as an excuse to crack down on the left, but in addition, the United States and Dominica then engaged in a, uh, well, a process of arms sales whereby the small nation was armed to at least to a much greater extent than it had previously been armed. And uh, it's worth noting that the conduits for the arms flowing to Dominica from the United States were, the, were not only Jamaica, but also the islands of Barbados, St. Vincent, and St. Lucia. And this is worth noting because those islands, along with Dominica, were the, well, they, they form an organization, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which basically nominally provided the excuse for the Reagan administration to launch their military incursion and conquest of, of uh, the island of Grenada last fall. Recall that initially, the Dominican coup attempt, as we've seen, was to be directed against Grenada, and this once the Grenadian target was switched to Dominica and the coup was, was the plotters were arrested, that uh, incipient coup, that intended coup, was used as an excuse to not only to crack down the left but to arm Dominica. And one of the interesting things is that the then armed Dominica participated in the invasion of Grenada along with the various states which served as the conduit for U.S. arms to Dominica. Again, keep all this in mind. Of the United States arming of Dominica following the abortive Klan and Nazi coup, Lawrence writes as follows. After the first Klan Nazi coup attempt, Prime Minister Charles flew to Washington to ask for U.S. military aid, which is being given in several forms. The State Department arranged a U.S. $60,000 grant, and a number of Dominican police are now undergoing training in Panama. U.S. arms and ammunition have been donated through Edward Siaga's government in Jamaica. Dominica will join Barbados, St. Vincent, and St. Lucia in a regional Coast Guard service while negotiations are underway toward the creation of a regional army. Meanwhile, the Barbados Defense Force, beefed up and modernized by the U.S., will be on call while the Dominican police force is expanded and given a paramilitary component. A CIA source told Robert Allen Michaels, writing for Caribbean Review, 
that Dominica is also being defended by, quote, a Western European nation or nations, unquote, probably France or Britain. Michaels also concurs with CAIB's report of CIA involvement on behalf of Eugenia Charles and the Freedom Party in the July 1980 election. So keep in mind the reports that the CIA actually helped Prime Minister Charles to power. Keep in mind that the the abortive coup directed by the Klansmen and Nazis served as an excuse not only for her to crack down on the left, but also as an excuse for her to, for that is, uh, Prime Minister Charles to arm Dominica. Recall that Prime Minister Charles appeared at Reagan's side when he announced the invasion of Grenada. Recall also that Grenada was, as we saw, the initial target of the Dominica coup plotters. KFJC Los Altos Hills. One of the most interesting things concerning the uh, aftermath of this coup was the fact that uh, of the, well, there are various accounts of 12, 28, or 40 plotters, or financial backers of the intended clan or Nazi coup against Dominica, only two of them were indicted. And David Duke, who admitted his involvement in the uh, coup right from the beginning, was not indicted. And this, of course, raises questions as to why these people weren't indicted. They broke the law. They uh, were violating the Neutrality Act. And yet, why weren't they indicted, or in most cases, even named? And, uh, of course, this once again suggests at least the possibility that uh, this group of Klansmen and Nazis may have been connected with the government, perhaps, as uh, Michael Perdue claimed, even operating on behalf of the U.S. government, while the the Dominica government was friendly to the United States, and so certainly the U.S. would not want it overthrown. It is worth noting that uh, the Klan and Nazi coup, as we've seen, was used by Prime Minister Charles to strengthen her hand, not only to eliminate the left-wing opposition or to crack down on the left, but also to arm her, her uh, regime as well. So in speculating concerning possible, I say possible motivations for U.S. involvement, U.S. government involvement with this group, the uh, strengthening of the Charles regime in Dominica certainly has to be regarded as a possible, and I underline possible, excuse for that involvement if that involvement was there. That, in, that the U.S. government may have been involved with this coup is uh, indicated by some of the strange circumstances and some of the uh, rather extraordinary legal maneuvering around the case, or a lack of legal maneuvering, I should say. Remember now that uh, only two of the financial backers of this plot were ever indicted, and yet of the 12 mercenaries that were going to be departing for Dominica, only 10 were arrested. There appear to be two missing and as un yet unnamed mercenaries. Of the strange handling of this case uh, following the arrest of the 12 people who were going to be going, the 12 mercenaries who were going to be heading to Dominica, Ken Lawrence writes as follows. While it is clear that the, while it is clear that the U.S. had strong reasons to nip the Klan Nazi conspiracy in the bud, what if the plotters had stuck to their original aim of overturning the Grenadian Revolution? It is possible that the U.S. and Canadian authorities might have looked the other way and permitted the attempt. Some aspects of the plot that are still being kept secret are suggestive. Why, for example, of the 12, 40, or 80 backers of the coup, depending on which report you choose to believe, were only two indicted by the grand jury? Why are the identities of the others not disclosed? Perhaps because the U.S. government has something to hide. Similarly, why was no action taken against the unidentified several others, unquote, the Los Angeles Times said refused to answer the grand jury's question? In this respect, David Duke is a significant figure. He was central to the original plot and never denied his role in it. He rebuffed the grand jury, yet no action at all was taken against him. This plus the highly suspicious fact that Duke sent Purdue to a boat captain who was an ATF informer lends some credibility to old charges leveled by Duke's Klan rivals that he's a government agent. If so, it would suggest that the U.S. looked favorably on the intentions of this ragtag bag of ragtag band of Klansmen, Nazis, and gangsters, so long as they kept their sights set firmly on Grenada. One cannot be certain, however. It seems unlikely that a group this weak and incompetent could pose a significant military threat to the Grenadian Revolution, even if assisted by Eric Gehry's fifth column on the island. But a failure by such a group is likely to sharpen the alertness of Grenadians to the threat their country faces from the U.S. Prime Minister, from the U.S. 
Prime Minister Maurice Bishop documented the seriousness of this danger in a letter to then UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim last August. Last August would be uh, in August of 1981. Bishop pointed out that the U.S. NATO military maneuver called Ocean Venture 81, the largest such exercise since World War II, had as its target a fictional group of Caribbean islands called Amber and the Amber Deans, a thinly disguised reference to Grenada and the Grenadines. The practice amphibious landing took place on the southeastern tip of the Puerto Rican island Vieques, which corresponds to an area of Grenada that actually is called Amber. Other equally obvious similarities were shown. With an, with an attack of this magnitude being practiced, it does seem improbable that a small and inept band of mercenaries would be considered a serious U.S. option. Recall now that uh, it is possible that this small and inept band of mercenaries may have been intended by the government as a uh, sort of a provocateur element in order to drive or propel uh, Prime Minister De Charles of Dominica to the right. Okay, that uh, certainly is one hypothesis that we looked at just a minute ago and uh, must be kept in mind, although uh, Lawrence's point here is certainly well taken, that a small group like this would not appear to uh, be the primary vehicle that the U.S. government would select to operate against Grenada in light of the, the massive military force which uh, was used in this maneuver and later, of course, in the actual invasion of Grenada itself. Still, though, the 12, 40, or 80 unnamed backers uh, of the coup and uh, many other curious circumstances concerning the handling or lack of handling of many of these plotters or alleged plotters is worth taking note of. One last uh, note here which Lawrence adds in that uh, regard concerns two unnamed members of the mercenary party. Initially 12 people were to be uh, ferried to the island of Dominica only 10 were arrested. Lawrence talks about this as follows. Another puzzle the U.S. hasn't answered concerns two unidentified members of the invading party. Purdue contracted with Howell. Howell was the guy who uh, was going to run the boat to get them to Dominica. Purdue contracted with Howell to transport 12, yet only 10 were arrested. Who were the other two? One was probably Canadian clan leader Alex McWhirter, M-C-Q-U-I-R-T-E-R. He had originally been slated to lead one of the mercenary groups, but couldn't join the group in New Orleans because he was barred from the U.S. in January of 1981. What about number 12? No one has yet identified the missing mercenary. Well, it is, uh, before summing up here, there's one last article that I'd like to uh, read you, and it, uh, well, it's, it's certainly, I think, food for thought under the circumstances here. Now, in the last broadcast uh, before this one, we took a look at a number of curious indications that David Duke might be a U.S. government agent, and uh, certainly his, the, the, the failure of uh, the, Dave, the fact that David Duke was not indicted here, despite the fact that he confessed his part in the, in the uh, intended coup against Dominica right from the beginning, is uh, still, well, it's, it has to be regarded, I think, as still further evidence that David Duke is a U.S. government agent. Uh, recall that one detective who had been monitoring the Klan for some years s speculated that Duke was CIA. And uh, keep in mind that the fact that uh, the initial target of these plotters was Grenada, and uh, keep in mind the fact that uh, eventually Grenada was invaded by and, and of course conquered by the United States. The, one of the uh, mercenaries who was arrested and is still in prison in connection with the plot against Dominica is a fellow by the name of Don Black. He succeeded David Duke as Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan when Duke went on to uh, his National Association for the Advancement of White People. And uh, the last article I'm going to read you here is a uh, plea by David Duke for the release of Don Black, and interestingly, he takes note of the fact that uh, the Dominican plotters were initially simply trying to do as private citizens what President Reagan was trying to do as president, and uh, it's worth keeping in mind whether uh, perhaps the Klan and Nazi group were actually functioning under U.S. government auspices when they attempted to invade Dominica, <clears throat> or perhaps when they were plotting to invade Grenada. Anyway... Research credit for the following article goes to Ted Rubenstein, who is currently working, or has up until recently been working as a research assistant with Rebel Magazine, a uh, Larry Flint publication coming out of Los Angeles. And Ted uh, got the following article for us from the Las Vegas Sun of October 28th of 1983. It's a UPI story, Dateline, New Orleans, and headlined, Ex-KKK Leader Reveals 79 Plot for Invasion. 
A former Ku Klux Klan leader Thursday revealed for the first time that he put some mercenaries of the deposed Prime Minister Eric Gehry in touch with some KKK members for invas an invasion of Grenada in 1979, but the plan was aborted in favor of a plot against neighboring Dominica. Breaking a four-year silence on the plot, David Duke, former Grand Wizard of the KKK, discussed the events in an interview with UPI and demanded freedom from jail for a Klansman who plotted against Prime Minister Eugenia Charles of Dominica. Duke, who was questioned by the federal grand jury that indicted Don Black and nine others, said, quote, The Grenada invasion is a very vindication of Don Black and the other valiant men who were arrested and prosecuted by overzealous federal agents for daring to fight against communism. I think it's a gross injustice that Mr. Black is imprisoned for trying to do courageously as a private citizen what President Reagan is trying to do today. Black, who took over as Grand Wizard when Duke resigned, is serving three years in the federal prison. Uh, one more uh, thing I think that's worth taking a look at in connection uh, with the attempted Dominican coup, one thing I forgot uh, to mention just a second ago, concerns uh, what eventually happened to J.W. Kirkpatrick. Now, Kirkpatrick was contacted by Duke to provide $10,000 to the coup plot, to, to the uh, Dominican coup plot. Now, eventually, when uh, word came out of Kirkpatrick's involvement, he committed suicide or allegedly committed suicide by shooting himself in the mouth. This is described by Ken Lawrence in Covert Action Information Bulletin. J.W. Kirkpatrick of Memphis, Tennessee, and an unidentified associate gave $10,000 to Purdue toward his original scheme to conquer Grenada. Kirkpatrick was a prominent attorney specializing in insurance defense, probate, corporate, family, medical malpractice, and personal injury law. He had written to David Duke, endorsing Duke's views following an appearance on television to promote the Ku Klux Klan, and the two were good friends for about four years. Duke sent Purdue to Kirkpatrick shortly after the original plot against Grenada was hatched. Five days after Purdue testified in court about Kirkpatrick's $10,000 contribution, and on the very day that the assistant U.S. attorney in New Orleans announced that he planned to seek indictments against the coup's financial backers, Kirkpatrick drove to Earl, Arkansas, and committed suicide with a shotgun. His law partner, Max Lucas, described him as, quote, a knight of old who preferred death to dishonor, unquote. Another colleague called him a super, ultra, ultra, ultra conservative. He thought the country was going to hell in a handbasket. And in a footnote to that passage I just read you, Ken Lawrence writes as follows. David Duke has questioned whether Kirkpatrick actually killed himself. It is true that the method, a shotgun blast in the mouth, is one that Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty has described as an assassination technique used by the CIA to eliminate evidence of murder. In this case, however, a suicide note not released to the press seems to have convinced Kirk Kirkpatrick's survivors that the act was just what it seemed to be. So again, we don't know, but uh, one of the two financial backers of this coup plot that, who did come to light died under as yet ambiguous circumstances. So uh, we, re we really don't know. But keep in mind the fact that... Uh, this whole thing may have been a U.S. government operation, and keep in mind the many U.S. government or possible U.S. government connections to it. Before we wind up here, I'd like to sum up what we've looked at in this broadcast. First of all, we began by taking a look at KKK leader or former KKK leader and possible U.S. government agent David Duke's central involvement, along with a man named Michael Perdue, in putting together a combined Nazi and Klan mercenary group, which was initially plotting with former Grenadian Prime Minister Eric, uh, Grenadian dictator Eric Gary, to take over the island of Grenada. When Gary and Perdue failed to see eye to eye concerning the methodology for that coup, the target was switched to the Caribbean island of Dominica, initially intended by the coup group as to serve them as a base of operations in their intended coup against Grenada. Following that, we took a look at Michael Perdue's assertions to the, the uh, coup participants or intended coup participants that uh, basically the coup was had the backing of the United States government and specifically the CIA and the State Department. Inter interestingly enough, Purdue also said that uh, former Texas governor and former Secretary of the Navy John Connolly was aware of the plot and was backing it as well. Next, we took a look at the fact that uh, this entire mercenary group was recruited and put together at a mercenary training camp run by an FBI informer named Frank Camper, last name C-A-M-P-E-R. 
And we also took a look at the fact that uh, Frank Camper's informing work for the FBI began when he was an, an, a, a, an attempted infiltrator of the anti-war movement. And it's worth noting that uh, even after his involvement in the Dominican coup attempt to surface, Camper was right back at work with his uh, mercenary school and uh, apparently was still well-connected and still uh, getting quite a, few adver- quite a few advertisements out to the mercenary community. And uh, one of the things that uh, the author of uh, the Covert Action Information Bulletin article we were looking at suggested was the possibility that uh, in his role as uh, a mercenary camp leader, basically Frank Camper was in a position to not only recruit mercenaries for uh, potential government undercover operations, but also to stifle any operations that the government did not approve of. And we took a look at the fact that this right-wing coup or attempted right-wing coup against the island of Dominica served Dominican Prime Minister Eugenia Charles as an excuse for a crackdown on the left. Furthermore, we took a look at the fact that this coup attempt was used by Charles and and the United States government as an excuse for arming the island of Dominica and the conduits through which the uh, these arms flowed from the US to Dominica were the uh, were the Jamaican government of Edward Siaga also the islands of St Vincent St Lucia and Barbados now all of those groups served in the the Eastern Caribbean uh, community of nations i've forgotten what the exact name of that organization is anyway in the uh, group of the association of caribbean nations basically whose sanction was sought out and received by the reagan administration for the grenadian invasion their request was the nominal excuse for the united states to go into grenada and all of these governments jamaica dominica st vincent st lucia and barbados were involved with the united states in the grenadian invasion at least nominally and uh, it's worth noting that uh, dominican prime minister eugenia charles who, according to Ken Lawrence, was installed by, or received help in her election by the CIA, that she was standing at Reagan's side when he announced the Grenadian invasion. Keep in mind that this right wing attempted right wing coup against her government was used as an excuse to move her government to the right. It would, did not serve as an excuse to move it to the left, as one might expect. And uh, finally, we took a look at some curious circumstances surrounding the handling of uh, some of the people involved or alleged to have been involved in this coup plot of the 1240 or 80 financial backers uh, that have been reported in various accounts of the coup only two were named and only two were indicted and who are these other unnamed conspirators and unindicted conspirators we can only speculate about it's worth noting too that david duke even though he admitted his involvement in the plot right from the beginning was never indicted still more evidence that david duke may be a government agent it's worth noting, too, that uh, although initially 12 people were to be ferried to Dominica, only 10 were named. So speculation has uh, mounted as to just who the two missing mercenaries actually were. Recall also that uh, of the two financial backers who were named, one of them died under rather strange circumstances, an alleged suicide, on the very day that uh, the U.S. attorney announced he was going to prosecute the financial backers of the coup. And also we took a look at uh, a plea from David Duke to release one of his lieutenants and the man who succeeded him uh, as head of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, a man named Don Black, one of the convicted Dominican plotters. And uh, as we saw, David Duke indicated that all they were trying to do as private citizens was what Reagan was attempting to do as president. And uh, as we speculated on throughout the broadcast, perhaps, and I say perhaps, the... Grenadian plotters, these uh, and, and eventual Dominican plotters, these Klansmen and Nazis, were also working for the government. That concludes the broadcast. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Radio Free. All right, and we're back live in the studios. This is Nip Tuck with Dave Emery, and you just finished listening to uh, actually two. Hard Rain segments back-to-back. The first one on David Duke, the second one on the Dominican invasion that would have been the Grenadian invasion, uh, or Amber and the Amber Deans. Otherwise known as Put Up Your Dukes. Yeah, Put Up Your Dukes. Oh, gosh, I bet people out there wishing we hadn't come back live for that. Uh, Anyway, we're going to take a short break. I think pretty much everything that you need to know in that context was summed up. Uh, We will be talking more after the break about some of this stuff. Again, we mentioned before Don Black 
and David Duke, both of whose names came up. And in the course of that, you remember the name of Alex McWhorter, M-C-Q-U-I-R-T-E-R. Alex McWhorter's name is going to come up later in the broadcast, but his involvement in the Dominica coup uh, attempt is significant, and we will be talking about that later. Also, remember Frank Camper. We're going to come back to him, too. Indeed. Okay, so again, as mentioned, we're going to take a quick break for about seven or eight minutes, play some music for you, give you a chance to get up and stretch. And I uh, just wanted to mention that the first song we're going to play was sent up explicitly to be played on this show by one of our faithful listeners to whom we are eternally grateful. And uh, it's by the grand old man of rock and roll, Chuck Berry. So you can all enjoy yourself and jump around a little bit while you're waiting for us to come back with more of Radio Free America here on KFJC. All right. And we are back in the studios. All right. And what you heard was Chuck Berry, Wouldn't Me, and uh, Melly Mel and Duke Booty, formerly of, uh, what, the Sugar Hill Gang, I guess, to begin? No, Furious Five. Anyway, I can't keep up with all that stuff. Survival. Survival was the name of the cut. And that, in fact, is what we're talking about. And uh, before that, of course, you heard two long segments from Hard Rain with Dave Emery. And Dave is, of course, live here in the studios. Uh, he is here in the studios. The program is live. Dave is alive or alive. I hope we've got that all straight. Okay. And uh, before we do, we're going to jump into a couple of short articles on the subject of uh, basically actually linking up um, what the overall concept of the show is we've been talking about. We talked about the fact that not only is there a specific Aryan nations, but that we're using that as our sort of general catch-all title for the whole thing, but that the current Aryan nations in, uh, in specifically the actual group that meets in Hayden Lake, Idaho, is the one that we have, uh, is one of the major factors right now as ter in terms of being a clearinghouse for ideas, uh, a meeting place for fascists and, and racists of all stripes, and also because of the connections of the people involved with Hayden Lake, Idaho, um, such as uh, uh, Wesley Swift and their involvement with such things as uh, the military, the intelligence uh, departments, and the aeronautics and space industry that uh, it makes them a somewhat powerful force. And then on top of that, their connection into the right-wing milieu with the KKK and the American Nazi Party and other groups of that ilk. So that's what we're talking about, and we're going to tie those strings up a little tighter between those two groups, the actual Aryan nations in, based in Hayden Lake and uh, the KKK and the rest of the milieu, uh, with an article from the Portland Oregonian for November 18, 1984. And they're talking about a gathering at the Aryan Nation's headquarters in Hayden Lake, Idaho. And it says, uh, at the gathering were Robert Miles, former Grand Dragon of the Michigan KKK, Don Black, a Grand Dragon of the KKK from Alabama, Edward Arlt, A-R-L-T, an Aryan Nations official from Texas, and Alexi Erlanger, E-R-L-A-N-G-E-R, -E uh, a leader of the Liberation Movement of the German Reich from Buffalo, New York. Now, again, Don Black, same gentleman that is currently in jail, um, who was involved with the Dominica coup plot, and who uh, basically that David Duke uh, portrayed as a great American who was just trying to do as a private citizen what Ronald Reagan was doing as a public citizen, which, of course, could be said of a lot of things that uh, have gone on with the Nazis and the Klan and the Reagan administration. Anyway, going along on that in that vein, as far as putting those particular groups together, and uh, the way that the uh, these groups have organized themselves and have linked themselves together is becoming more and more uh, sophisticated, and more and more also the Aryan Nations itself is becoming a linking or a linkage area for these groups. Now, the, there are an awful lot of clan groups around, and so maybe giving uh, giving the name of this particular group, the, the main group that we're looking at is the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. There's also a group that call themselves the White Knights, whether that's an offshoot or not, but the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan are what we're looking at. Uh, David Duke was the Grand Dragon originally, succeeded by Don Black, the fellow from the Dominican invasion, along with David Duke, and also a fellow named Louis Bean is the head of the Texas Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. That's the Texas wing of that organization, because it's the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan that we're going to be looking at, also very briefly at the Invisible Empire, headed up by Bill Wilkinson. But the main clan group that we're looking at in connection with Aryan Nations is the, uh, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. I'm going to read a short segment now from an article uh, originally from the New York Times of September 9, 1985. The headline is 11 in Neo-Nazi, quote, Order, 
on trial today. Of course, they're referring to the group that calls itself the Order or the Silent Brotherhood, part of the Aryan Nation's umbrella. And uh, they're talking about two people here whose names I think might have been mentioned, uh, are, are mentioned in the article that uh, are not explained in the section we're reading. One is Matthews. Matthews, of course, is Robert Matthews, who was one of the lead, who was the leader of the group and who died in a shootout with authorities at Whidbey Island. Um, Matthews was also one of the people who apparently, they claim, uh, helped to plot the assassination of talk show host Alan Berg in Denver, Colorado. Um, now, the other man they're going to refer to is going to be called only the man in room 14. That man is a man by the name of Martinez, who was a, uh, apparently a government informant who infiltrated uh, the order. Okay, again, reading from that article, 11 in Neo-Nazi Order on Trial. Before Mr. Matthews, Robert Matthews again, was killed December 7, 1984, in a fire set by illumination flares on Whidbey Island in Puget Sound, in a shootout with 200 state and federal officers, his name was signed to a letter reproduced on a computer link-up known as the Aryan Liberty Network, reached by telephone line with a code name. The letter read, in part, quote, As for the traitor in room 14, we will eventually find him. If it takes 10 years and we have to travel to the ends of the earth, we will find him. And, true to our oath, when we do, we will remove his head from his body. Unquote. The computer network was set up by a Texas Ku Klux Klansman, Louis Beam, who is also an official of the Aryan Nations, a neo-Nazi group based at Hayden Lake, Idaho, of which the Order is a splinter group. So again, the connections uh, very tight. Here we have a man who's setting up the computer network who is not only a Texas Klansman, but also an official of the Aryan Nations. Okay. Now, the uh, Lewis Beam here basically is uh, a fellow who, again, succeeds the, the, the line of succession from David Duke to Don, well, actually, uh, Don Black hasn't really uh, resigned from the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Black is the, uh, the the head still, succeeding David Duke, but his Texas lieutenant, the fellow who heads up his Texas organization, is Lewis Beam and also a key official with Aryan Nations. And uh, that's important to remember because we do have the, uh, the this line of transition from Duke. Actually, we should think of the line of transition and succession from George Lincoln Rockwell, which is where Duke got his start, to David Duke, to Don Black, and uh, along with Don Black, his Texas lieutenant, the head of his Texas organization of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, Louis Beam, not only a member of the Aryan Nations, but specifically the person who sets up the Aryan Nations uh, computer network. So, uh, again, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan and the, the Duke line of succession is what we're really looking at. And an unidentified associate contributed $10,000 to help finance the plot. Purdue later said he got another $45,000 from James White, a business associate. In Toronto, they worked out a plan for the attack. It called for Gary to accompany the landing party from Dominica and lead his Grenadian supporters. But Gary refused. He was unwilling to land until a mercenary force had captured police headquarters in the army barracks. The argument that ensued between Purdue and Gary ended their partnership, and Purdue began to consider other possibilities. Well, specifically, Purdue uh, redirected this uh, incipient clan and Nazi coup against the island of Dominica. Initially, as we just saw, to the island of Dominica was to have been used as an operational base for the planned attack upon Grenada. Now, one of the details here that Lawrence points out, which uh, is significant for our purposes here, is the fact that Michael Purdue represented this coup attempt. He represented the incipient coup against Dominica as basically as a U.S. government op Grenada was the target. The aim was to overthrow the revolution led by the New Jewel Movement and to return the ousted tyrant Eric Gehry to power. Mercenary leader Michael Perdue of Houston, Texas, began plotting his counter-revolution as soon as he read published accounts of the revolution in the spring of 1979. First, he sought out Gehry, met him in San Diego, and put forward this proposition. For a price, Purdue would overturn Maurice Bishop's government and reinstate Gary as prime minister. Gary agreed and told Purdue to proceed. Purdue then contacted his old friend in New Orleans, David Duke, one-time Nazi and former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, now leader of the National Association for the Advancement of White People. 
Duke helped by putting Purdue in touch with several of his contacts, beginning a tangled web of international fascist intrigue and high finance. One of Duke's referrals was to German Bong, Germans is, uh, in this particular clan and Nazi coup attempt concerns the fact that all the Klansmen and Nazis gathered at and were recruited from a mercenary training school which is run by the Ku Klux Klan. It, um, and I guess actually this is not formally a Ku Klux Klan mercenary training school. The Klan itself does have a number of uh, sort of so-called Klan and Special Forces training school, Klan Special Forces training schools. But uh, this particular group of Klansmen and Nazis were assembling at uh, the mercenary training school of a fellow by the name of Frank Camper, last name C-A-M-P-E-R. As it turned out, Frank Camper works for the FBI. He's an FBI informer. And uh, in addition, it's worth noting that uh, Camper's entire mercenary school was once busted near a nuclear power plant where they were conducting some sort of unspecified operation. At any rate, keep in mind the fact that uh, Frank Camper is a government agent because it was at his camp that the basic recruiting was done for this particular uh, attempted coup. Born Wolfgang W. Droge, D-R-O-E-G-E, -E, an organizer for the KKK in Canada whose father had been a personal friend of notorious Nazi war criminal Julius Stryker, last name S-T-R-E-I-C-H-E-R. -E Another was Don Andrews, A-N-D-R-E-W-S, former head of the Western Guard, Canada's neo-Nazi party. A third was J. W. Kirkpatrick, a prominent, a prominent attorney in Memphis, Tennessee, whose ties to Duke and the Klan had never been publicly revealed. Keep in mind Kirkpatrick here, because we're going to talk about him again later in the broadcast. Each of these men eagerly joined the burgeoning conspiracy against the young revolution in tiny Grenada. Droge became second in command of the invasion force. Andrews recommended using the island of Dominica as a base for the attack on Grenada, and on the recommendation of his friend Arnie Poli, P-O-L-I, invested in a Dominican coffee firm to furnish cover for intelligence gathering trips and supply shipments. Kirkpatrick operation, this is how he represented it to the Klansmen Nazis he recruited for his group. And obviously, all official uh, statements concerning this venture were that uh, Purdue's statements about U.S. government support were puffery. However, as we're going to see, there are indications that indeed the government may have had unspecified connections with this particular coup attempt, or at least with this particular group, if not for this particular attempt. At any rate, if Michael Purdue's claims that uh, the United States government was behind this Klan and Nazi coup, Ken Lawrence writes as follows. All the recruits were gathered under false pretenses. Purdue told them he was a Vietnam veteran with combat mercenary experience in both Nicaragua and Uruguay. He claimed he had backing from the CIA and the State Department, and that former Texas Governor John Connolly and U.S. Representative Ronald Paul of Houston knew what he was doing and approved of it. He told them he would be fighting communism in Dominica. Still another indication, a very hard indication, of the involvement of U.S. government forces.